to talk about this amazing topic to introduce us to surgical research we have chinmay here with us so thank you so much chinmay for joining us and over to you hello everyone it's so good to see you all here and th- thank you so much snehal for that beautiful introduction uh so today's topic is uh something that is very close to my heart because i am an uh, aspiring a uh, surgeon scientist and i have been working in this field like for the past 2 years with uh, some really cool and great people so let's get uh, started so uh, the first thing for our kids here is like what is surgery so surgery is a medical treatment in which doctors called surgeons use certain tools like the tools may be like scalpel scissors or or many other tools to work on a patient's body uh it is actually a field of medicine that treats diseases and injury by fixing or removing the affected parts of the body for example uh like uh, you you can tell me uh, have you guys heard of any surgeries before like any examples okay so everybody in the chat window is saying they have heard of the word surgery at least before Oh, um, that okay. is so awesome! Yeah, yeah. we can see Avish, that. And Avish says plastic surgery. Oh, that is cool. That, that is gets a lot of yeah. popular news feature, <laughs> exactly. right or wrong reasons. But eye surgery, Snehal, <laughs> they say leg surgery, heart surgery, brain surgery. Yeah, that is they so have, wonderful. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I I think you guys. like most of you know like are very somewhat familiar to what a surgery is or for those of you who are not familiar you might have heard the term operation instead like uh, maybe in your daily topics so operation and surgery are one and the same things uh next slide please okay great so surgery is basically team work you guys might have like you guys might be playing some team sports like football and cricket and everything and uh, everything related so surgery is just like that you need a whole team so that uh, you can ensure that your patient get gets the best treatment that that is available surgeons like as, as you can see in this photo they work in operating rooms that are brightly lit extremely clean they are almost free of germs and they are stocked with many uh, various tools and supplies uh yeah so now like a surgeon alone cannot fulfill his daily tasks they need a whole team comprising of skilled multi generational and very culturally diverse members uh like besides the leading surgeon you may have some junior surgeons as well who may assist them in their daily procedures uh also we have an anesthesiologist and an operating room nurse i can say that uh these two like the anesthesiologist and the nurse also like they are a very important part of the whole surgical team and even though each specialty has a specific focus all the members actually share a common goal that goal is to provide the best patient care experience in a positive work environment and the best way to accomplish that goal is through team work uh, that's awesome chinma let's talk for some questions so yeah. the first question um kavish asks is there a minimum time a surgery will take so let's rephrase this like what's your prep time before you actually make the incision if the incision mm-hmm. marks the start of the procedure what's your prep time like uh yeah so i can give you an example from my own life like the surgeries that i have observed like actually take uh, around like the preparation time takes around uh, half an hour to one hour and the duration of the surgery like the actual procedure it has no limits <laughs> i yeah. like it, it it can last from just around 15 to 20 minutes to maybe around uh 7 to 8 hours so you you need to be in that you, you need to have a focused mind to uh, do all the stuff you need to be in the space you certainly yeah. can't be saying i need to <laughs> uh, i i need to catch a television show after this <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> right you 
I mean, you go in, you go in. You don't know when you'll come out. That's true. <laughs> so, Anirudh also. Still, yeah, go ahead. There are some good questions. Yeah. We have yeah. question from Vishnu. He asks, "What is or who is an anesthesiologist? Can you tell us what is?" Oh, okay. So, actually, uh, anesthesiologist, like I said, is a part of the surgery team, but that is a different specialty from surgery, and it is as integral to to the team as any other person. so uh like you may you may have experience like when uh, a surgery is being performed the anesthesiologist makes sure that the patient doesn't uh suffer from any pain and he get he get rids of that pain for the patient he uh, administers certain chemicals via injection or something and that is helpful to the patient so that he should not experience any pain while the surgery has been done that's really really important so it's a totally yeah. different branch of medicine that yeah, you would train in to do that absolutely exactly okay okay we have another very interesting question in the chat window um is there something called hair? like do people do surgeries on hair we talked about brain surgery we talked about so many different organs is there something called hair surgery I think so. All the hair transplant being done all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you can get artificial hair if you want. Uh, so there are they like that is also a concept <laughs> in today's world. <laughs> yeah. And of course, there are specialized surgeons who do that, right? There, there'll be yeah. a dermatologist or maybe a reconstructive surgeon. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's go ahead, and then we'll come back to some more questions in a later. Okay, okay, great. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, now what are the steps of a typical surgery? So before performing the surgery, the doctors and the nurses wash their hands thoroughly. They also put down, uh, put on gowns, caps, gloves, and masks to keep the germs away from the patient. Like those are separate clothes and not the uh, normal clothes that you wear in your daily life. Also, they set up like these huge machines that will keep track of the patient's breathing and heart rate. You might have seen uh, these machines in uh, certain in some movies or serials who make which make like a beep 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 sound. So those are exactly those machines. Uh, the sound might be somewhat irritating, but uh, they are very like incredibly useful for uh, the procedure <laughs> i think if the sound is there it's irritating if the sound is not there you need to galvanize into action basically that's exactly. what it means so, uh, the beep sound is good <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh yeah also like uh, like i mentioned before uh in the surgery uh, you make use of certain chemicals to numb the part of the patient's body on which they will operate that is the job of the anesthesiologist or they may put the patient to sleep with a uh, like cer- certain drugs which are also used for the procedure and like i said under anesthesia the patient doesn't feel any pain so that is a really good thing uh yeah have you heard of anything like do, do you know of a- any other like similar steps Oh uh, yeah, Kavish mentioned the term ICU. He says he's familiar with oh. an intensive care. You've we've heard it. Um, another that interesting so question, uh, Chinmay. Do surgeons eat food or water if the surgery is going to take seven to eight hours? I mean, we certainly don't want the surgeon fainting on the bed, bedside, on the operating uh, table. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't yeah. sound like fun. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, from what I have observed, like the surgeons don't eat during the procedure however they make sure that they are well uh, that they are well fed <laughs> before the procedure <laughs> so like their stomachs are somewhat full before the procedure and make definitely sense. not during the procedure definitely not but then if it's such a long surgery probably they can take breaks yeah they they can they, they can they would yes. like if it's two cardiac surgeons then they will work in t- tandem Yeah, probably true. right mm-hmm. eight hours is too much even if you have eaten before the surgery <laughs> yeah right um so uh, this is a good question ala had snehal you wanted to go ahead yeah sure go ahead uh, she asks 
uh, is there any surgery without anesthesia can you do a surgery without anesthesia uh, or do all surgeries need anesthesia and um, nowadays most of the uh, surgeries use anesthesia but like there might be certain small surgeries like uh, like for example if you have uh, broken your uh, leg then the surgeon might perform a quick uh, stitches or something also this is a very exciting question because it uh, reminds me of the historical part of anesthesia now before anesthesia was invented uh like there were no ways to uh, reduce the pain of the patient and you can imagine like uh doing all those surgeries while the patient is screaming and it is he is crying of such a pain that would be so horrible so anesthesia is the way to go <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um another very interesting question is are there maybe some people for whom this doesn't work all these chemicals that are used to numb the pain maybe they it just doesn't work with their body so what do they do in such cases or if they're allergic to those chemicals uh yeah that is also a great question so like there are a variety of these chemicals variety of anesthesia chemicals that we call them and uh, like the job of the anesthesiologist is to ensure that that particular chemical is suitable for the patient's body so that is the whole job of the anesthesiologist and that is why he is present throughout the procedure like till the start to the end in the room so he actually takes care of that very well <laughs> uh, he or she can take care of that he okay that yes yes okay okay let's move on lots of questions chinmay and sneha lots of questions but we'll come back to them guys okay Uh, we'll come back to them okay uh yeah next slide please uh yeah so let's get into like what is thoracic surgery thoracic surgery uh is the field that is that that i have been working with since the past two years so the first question is what is the thorax actually uh so the definition of thorax is the area of the body situated between the neck and abdomen but like let's do one thing take your hand and put it above your stomach and can you feel some hard structures over there uh, don't press too hard okay don't press too hard so these are the bones of the thorax together they are known as the rib cage okay above your stomach and they protect the delicate organs of the thorax like the organs may be your heart like you can see in the picture that you can notice the lungs there and between the lungs there is our heart uh do you know of any other organs in the thorax like apart from heart uh, and lungs okay, okay let's see <laughs> yeah is the spinal cord considered a part of the thorax uh you not not exactly but that is situated in that part not it is not exactly a part of thorax but you can call it something yeah. okay so this is the pancreas uh i'm not i don't the pancreas is part of abdomen, abdomen which is situated below the thorax yeah like think a little of your stomach th- think a little <laughs> higher than the liver and kidney yeah like That, in this part yeah <laughs> think, think around your heart think around below, your heart below your neck above your stomach yeah exactly lungs are apart yeah diaphragm oh that is a really go- cool answer if i may say <laughs> wonderful wonderful so if i can tell you there are a bunch of other organs known as the thymus and the pleura so the th- what is thymus i'll just tell you briefly it is a part of the immune system uh, what is immune system it is a system of the body which helps us to fight uh, all the germs that we are getting inside our body like throughout the day <laughs> uh yeah uh great then can we move to the next slide so just to summarize chinna oh, yeah. the basic thorax will be what lungs heart the great vessels of the heart yes the, the thymus, great vessels of the heart the pleura that covers the lungs just so that yeah. they know so a thoracic surgeon will operate these organs yeah okay. exactly yes 
Uh, great then. So what is thoracic surgery now? So like I said, thoracic surgery focuses on the chest organs, like the organs in the thorax, including the heart, lungs, esophagus, and trachea. About 80% of thoracic surgery involves surgery for some sort of cancer. And when I say 80%, so majority of those surgeries are on lung cancer because lung cancer is actually uh, like people usually do not uh, have, people usually don't know this, but lung cancer is the deadliest cancer in the whole world. And it is like the, no, like the number of deaths from lung cancer are actually far more than the uh, other cancers, which are from second to fifth number combined. So that is a really huge uh, thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, what are some well-known thoracic surgeries? Have you guys uh, heard of any of them? Like, or do you know any other surgeries apart from those mentioned here? Like, you you must have heard about bypass surgery because that is a very common topic in India right now. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. sure. So your coronary bypass surgery is a thoracic surgery. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Kavish says he has heard of cardiac surgery. That is that is true. Yes. Uh, yeah. And also there are other types of surgery. Like like I said, all the surgeries of the lung and all the surgeries which are related to heart or to the vessels of the heart, which uh, if, like we have mentioned, aortic surgery here. Aorta is a vessel of the heart. Uh, so these are also included. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please. So let's get into the talk. After like now we know the basic things. Let's get right into the topic. What is surgical research? So research is at the fore forefront of patient care, whether it is medical or surgical. Clinical research is actually what allows doctors to decide how to best treat the patients and. It is what makes the development of new medicines, uh, new procedures, new procedures for surgery, and new tools uh, whenever possible. Without clinical research, we would not be able to decide if new treatments are better than the current ones. And that is exactly how doctors find the most effective treatments of care for all our patients. Uh, yeah, so here... Take some questions before we go into this. Sure. Yes. Um, yeah. Let's look at. We'll pick up some questions from the chat window. But maybe one thing that you did mention, you know, is also tools, right? How surgical research can help when there are new tools around. So can you yeah. tell us a little more about what kind of tools or um, how is that research done? Uh, exactly. So like when I say tools, uh, I mean uh, basic tools like uh, scissors and scalpel. So like whenever, like, I'm sure like some of you in the audience will go, like would, would be interested to go into the field of medicine and you, you, you will be in medical school someday. You will actually get to see those tools. And there are like in our, uh, in our homes, we have a particular type of scissor. But when you actually are a surgeon, you have a range of scissors. Like you have, you might have 10 types of scissors you might have 10 types of blades. So knowing which blade, knowing which scissor to, uh, when to use what is actually uh, like, you get that from experience and all the years of surgical training. Very nice. Okay. Chinmay Ala has a nice question, Nehal. Why do surgeons always wear red, sorry, green, white, or blue? Why don't we see red uh, scrubs? They are called scrubs, right? Yeah, they are called scrubs. So is there yeah. a reason these colors have been chosen based on the light in the OT or something like that? Uh, yeah, exactly. So like uh, the ultimate aim uh, of everything is to make sure that the patient feels comfortable. So like, hence we have chosen certain colors that which can be comfortable to the eyes of the patients as well as to the eyes of all the people uh, that are operating in the room. So uh, and these colors have been show, have been like f have been found to be the most uh, comfortable ones, if I may say. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Abhay asks a question: uh, Can he become a surgeon if he is scared of blood? <laughs> 
Have you ever met surgeons who say that when we were young, we were really scared of blood, but we just grew over it, like we grew out of it? Absolutely, absolutely. I think most of the surgeons have told me the same thing <laughs> that, like, at certain point of time when they were in high school and uh, around that age, they were uh, scared of uh, like blood and. Uh, when they whenever they used to see something on tv they used to get really uh, worried <laughs> but actually as you get more and more experience with that you actually get comfortable with all the procedures and uh, uh, yeah you get comfortable with time so that is the and that is actually a major part of your curriculum which is taught in your medical school so yeah <laughs> so there's a nice thing that's come together chinme uh, fear of blood color of scrubs so why do you think all of you let's see if we can get with this together why would you not choose scrubs to be red yeah blood is red okay yes. so you and everyone like like you said everyone is fe- fearful of blood so we don't want any fear in the operating room so that's why red is a complete no no <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely, and another reason, Chinma, is if there he's bleeding, a patient is bleeding excessively. You won't see the blood if it's everything is red. If the yeah, sheets and the surgeon's true. clothes are mm-hmm. red, right? Yeah. So yeah. that is also a reason. <laughs> so now we know. Now we know <laughs> that if you want to become a surgical fashion designer, you need to go with pastel tones. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think let's move ahead, and then we'll come back for questions again. Uh. Okay. Great. So next slide, please. uh fantastic so now we have the first re- example of research here so th- this is a very uh, uh i don't know why this happened sorry what has happened um to reset let me just try this is it back uh no i think maybe you can stop sharing and try to share this uh, is what happens if i try and type Yeah, maybe just actually just share only your Chrome and not the whole screen. Yeah. Um, because that. Sorry be... about that, Chinme. No, I'm no. sorry about that. Yeah. No, no worries. Sorry. No. Okay, so uh, while we're fixing that, we have a few questions yeah. uh, in the okay. meantime. So Raghav asks, when was anesthesia invented? Uh yeah, I think it was in uh the 19th century. I am not exactly sure of which year, but uh, it was in the. 19th century and the first like the first procedure with anesthesia was performed at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston which is uh, if you may know the hospital affiliated to Harvard University yeah so that is a really uh, famous institution in the United States and yeah all right okay let's go ahead and look at this case fantastic uh great then yeah so this is actually a very popular study from one of my mentors uh who is a lung cancer surgeon at uh, harvard university and let's get let I, i like i know this title would seem a little scary to you <laughs> so let's go through every word now uh Okay, great. So the first thing is na- a national analysis of short-term outcomes and long-term survival following thoracoscopic versus open lobectomy for clinical stage two non-small cell lung cancer. So there are two types of surgeries here. Two types of surgery for lung cancer. Uh, the first surgery is thoracoscopic lobectomy, and you can see the word versus here. Okay, so like we are comparing something. That, that's why we have the word versus. the first thing first type of surgery is thoracoscopic lobectomy the second surgery is open lobectomy open lobectomy non small cell lung cancer is actually a type of cancer is actual type of lung cancer so there are two major types of lung cancer small cell and non small cell so we are uh, researching into non small cell uh, next slide please yeah so our aim here is to compare which patient survive more like after receiving surgery the patients who receive uh, open lobectomy or the patients who receive vats uh, video assisted thoracoscopic surgery 
uh, as their preferred procedure. Now, uh, if you can see in this figure of open lobectomy, uh, you can see that those dotted lines actually represent the uh, incision, where the incision is made, where the body of the patient is cut. So that is a big thing, that is a big incision. And as compared to VATS lobectomy, you can see like it is, it almost like it involves very small incisions, uh, like you can, can hardly see them. VS, so VATS lobectomy is a type of minimally invasive surgery. Minimally in invasive surgery has smaller cuts involved and you, you cannot like, you, like as I can, tell you, you can hardly see them in the figure, okay? And uh, so that is a, a relatively newer type of surgery as compared to open lobectomy. And the aim of our surgery was, uh, of our research was to compare these two patients. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So how was this research done? So the first step was to choose your patient groups. So uh, choose what type of patients you want to include in your research. Here we are performing research on patients suffering from a particular type of cancer called as non-small cell lung cancer. The step two is now we want to obtain some specific information about these patients. As our research is going to compare two types of surgeries, we need this information of which patients, which group of patients received which type of surgery. Now, how do we obtain this information? Uh, yeah. Uh, sure, go ahead. Now, go ahead. Now, how do we obtain this information? From hospitals because they keep a record of all the patients, like which medicines were given to them, which type of surgery was performed on them. And like you could, you can see the title was a national analysis. So uh, in this study, we uh, like took patients from all over the country uh, to perform, uh, like to perform their analysis and compare between them. That's so just to clarify, Chinmay, it was retro in retrospect, yeah. these surgeries yeah. for non-small cell lung cancer had been done. Some yeah. people were done the VATs, some were done open, and yeah. you now were taking the data out, right? So it's not that you were proactively searching for people who needed the surgery. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Correct? Yeah. Okay. So it okay. was a retrospective study, meaning that the patients already had had undergone these surgeries like previously, like some years ago, and we just took their data and analyzed them. Okay. So, so this is one way of doing surgical research, looking at records. This is one way. Okay. Yeah. The other types are prospective studies and like very famous things called clinical trials, where you sure. actually enroll the patients and then you start surveying them. <laughs> so Chinmay, so, maybe yeah. one thing important to clarify here, is okay. these these had these were patients that had already had the surgery so the hospital yes. like you said already had all their information so did you just call the hospital and did they just give you the information or do you have to get approvals you know uh, make sure the patient is okay with sharing their data did you have to do all of that exactly so that is a very important thing uh, which is called ethical research and we want to make sure that uh, the patients are completely okay with that we are taking their data for certain studies. So like we have to get all the approvals, which takes like a significant amount of time, but Certainly. that is very, that, that is a very important of every study, like every research in every part of uh, like science. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what are the results? Like what did we actually find? Uh, both groups of patients had similar survival. Like both of them survived almost for the same years after they received their surgery. However, the patients who received VATS, which was a minimally invasive surgery, okay, mm -hmm. had a shorter hospital stay, less complications, and decreased pain. I wanted to ask this question to you: like, how do you think like these three points, shorter hospital stay, less complication, and decreased pain, how do you think that this can improve the patient care and the comfort of the patient? if I may ask. So we'll wait to hear from them. So basically yes. we look back at the records. Yeah. We concluded that survival was the same, but there were lesser complications, pain and hospitalization. Mm -hmm. Hospitalization means costs, yes. additional risks. 
so he can see his family sooner yes if he's in the hospital less the patient Such is already going answer. through so much yes so they all i mean we definitely have the heart in surgical research ready we know. so maybe uh, so what and hmm. ask if you were the researcher on this stem and if you saw this conclusion you saw that both the patients groups different kinds of surgeries done but they have the same survival rate but the ones that had the minimally invasive surgery they had all of these benefits they had decreased pain so shorter hospital day what would you say what would be the conclusion of your research uh yeah so the con- conclusion for me which i will tell to my patients in the future is that i would prefer them to have vats instead of open lobectomy because that would be comfortable for them only it, like all those all these points that they would suffer less they, there would be less pain our ultimate job is to ensure that our patient is comfortable and gets the best treatment that is possible yeah. fantastic so, okay we VATs. can move on chin mai we have quite a few slides left so let's move on yeah great great uh, yeah. so the second is case study of research uh, the next case study now this is a very very interesting topic actually it does anyone in the audience know what is augmented reality you might have heard it like it is a very catchy term right now <laughs> and today is world okay no no problem yeah virtual oh that is great uh okay can can you move to next slide please thank you yeah i'm sure you guys must have must know what is pokemon go like which game is pokemon go so pokemon go is augmented reality basically and you and we are now adapting the same in all our medical surgery so as you can see in the first picture here there is an ipad okay and uh, you can see like <laughs> it is it is not a very accurate representation of i want of, of what i want to say but augmented reality is something that the objects are not there in front of your uh, in front of your eyes but through a device like the an ipad or your phone you can actually see them and uh, like you can say augmented reality is an enhanced version of the real physical world and uh, uh, next slide please i think that, that would help to better explain uh, yeah so uh, revolutionizing surgery training so what is telestration and like you guys must have I have one you. thing I think let's go back to the study what is the topic okay. we didn't really okay, tell okay. them what the topic of the case study was okay okay yeah. so it was to study telestration and augmented yeah. reality yeah. in minimally so, invasive surgery in covid yeah. times because we were all moving to virtual approaches in covid exactly exactly for remote monitoring of surgery so can augmented reality and telestration help us during covid times yeah and in the future yeah. for remote monitoring Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is this is augmented reality, all right? And then, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So telestration. I was saying that uh, you can. You may know that you can actually draw on your tablets and iPads with the sort of digital pencils that you have, and uh, it is actually used to like this whole technology, like telestration, combined with augmented reality, is now used to provide mentoring. and instructions remotely like for example a surgeon from india can guide a surgery for a patient in an operating room in the usa so that is a really cool thing right now especially in the covid times when everything has to be virtual like all the teaching classes all the mentoring sessions are v- virtual in today's world yeah and now we have a video actually uh, in the next slide i think that would help to explain better yeah so can you guys see what is actually happening here this is an example of both telestration and augmented reality combined that is the senior surgeon who is teaching his junior the steps to perform the surgery that they are going to do that day when all of you would grow up and if some of you would go into medical school you will get to experience this first hand and realize actually how cool is this and at that time medical science will be so much more advanced than it is now and things would be much more cool and amazing than as they are now like you can actually like 
this sort of technology actually helps to reduce the risk while the training of surgeons is being done because uh, while they are being trained they are prone to make some mistakes so this type of new technology helps to reduce those uh, mistakes so maybe just to clarify for everybody this is like a, an artificial um, situation that's being created this is not a surgery that's being done on an actual patient no no it, it is not an actual situation because you can't take that risk on a patient because when you are like learning something learning something new you are bound to make mistakes so we are instead of actually trying to uh, uh, make mistakes uh, like uh, make mistakes we you can make mistakes in the virtual world okay that sort of r- reduces like the <laughs> discomfort if i may say of course and uh, surgeons trainee surgeons can also practice several yeah. times in this virtual reality before getting on to the patient right exactly big factor yeah. okay <laughs> yeah now the most important fact uh, topic here is thoracic surgery for lung cancer thoracic surgery like i said before remains the preferred treatment for lung cancer in combination with chemotherapy chemotherapy you might have heard is uh, administration of certain chemicals which uh, help us to combat cancer now most of in the surgery like there are different types of surgeries per- performed for lung cancer the most common of it is lobectomy lobectomy is actually removing a certain part of the lung or a certain lobe of the lung i have a picture actually in the probably the next slide i will show you that or but if the cases are severe like uh, very like very advanced stages of cancer you might have actually to uh, you might need to remove a whole lung so that is also <laughs> a thing and the picture uh, so this is actually uh, i should tell you this is a graphical representation not a real picture okay you can see those red things those are actually the tumors okay those are actually the lung cancer tumors and like you might be knowing smoking which is a major cause of lung cancer smoking is a really bad thing because the tobacco smoke contains many bad chemicals as i have written 7000 more than 7000 chemicals and linked to about 80% to 90% of lung cancer deaths uh next slide please but <laughs> till now like the thought in people's mind was that smoke uh, like lung cancer is only due to smoking so what the uh, recommendations that we had for lung cancer screening included only like only the people who smoked uh, were eligible but new research from last year finds that non smokers should also be screened regularly for lung cancer uh, yeah and chinma you can just tell them what is screening what do we mean by screening yeah what do we mean by screening actually so you might have heard of certain types of screenings like ct scan mri scan so uh, these are type of techniques like radi- radiological techniques which help to find uh, certain things in, in our body in our body like screening for lung cancer helps us to find like where the tumor is actually located and how many tumors are located that is a C- ct scan which we do for lung cancer uh, yeah so in that in that picture you can see that a part of the lung is being cut that is what i was referring to as lobectomy where you are uh, removing a lobe of uh, the lung which is the lower lobe which is the lower part of the lung now uh, like i said the current guidelines for lung cancer are just for smokers but the guidelines that will come in the next few years because of the new studies new research that is being done uh, will also include smokers and non smokers as well so as screening increases as lung cancer screening increases more and more uh, patients will be diagnosed with lung cancer and hence more and more of number of surgeries will be performed which is which would increase the job of the thoracic surgeons <laughs> yeah uh next slide please So we have a question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously, this new study shows that even people who don't smoke, so non-smokers, should also be screened 
for lung cancer. That probably means that there are other causes of lung cancer as well, apart from yes. just smoking. So can you tell us more about what are these causes? Do we know? Yes. So the most important cause, like which is not smoking related, is genetic. Is genetic cause like the like lung cancer is a disease which is passed from family generations to generations. So, uh, but what was what happened previously is that those people were actually not included in screening. That screening they were not eligible for screening. So that was a very you know odd thing because uh, lung cancer is actually. Uh, is is like I, I can say eighty percent of the cases are in non-smokers, but twenty percent, even twenty percent, is a huge thing. And now that they are finally included, that is, I think, a good. You said eighty percent are in smokers. Eighty percent are in smokers, yes. but twenty percent is a huge number for non-smokers. And there, yes. the reasons can be family tendencies, genetics, also exposure to certain industrial pollutants, asbestos, yes. beryllium. etc exactly. so depending on their uh, work right if yeah. they are workers in asbestos factories etc yeah. right yeah. okay so also that 20% same, is also yeah. huge to to yeah. not screen them at all and not, not try and detect <laughs> the cancer early so that they can exactly. have treatment right yeah. yes okay okay getting it all right uh, can born with lung cancer anirudh anil i mean there are some rare congenital lung cancers but very very rare It lung mm-hmm. cancer is not a cancer people are usually born with. Yeah, <laughs> very very rare. So okay. What we all mean when we say there's the genetic mutation, it doesn't mean you're born with it. It just means that because of some genetic reasons, you have you are more likely to have the disease. Yes. Uh, yeah. As you grow older. Okay. So it's not yes. necessarily you will be born with. Yes. Uh, so like you have a tendency to develop that disease when you grow up. Not that. you will be having lung cancer as soon as you are born <laughs> okay uh, next slide please so i what is the future of research and technology i, I would like to ask you all this question like what do you think uh, like I, i let me first tell you what is happening in this picture uh, this is actually a very cool thing if you can look uh on the bed side like above that that is actually a robot and on the left side of the picture there are two surgeons who are operating that robot that they are actually operating that the arms of the, that robot and that thing is actually very similar to your playstation console like they actually have uh, like these consoles in their hand and they are controlling like this 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 and it is like when you actually observe that it is a really cool thing to observe and what uh, what are the advantages of this is that this thing is much more precise to when you do the surgeries manually uh, yeah so and i am really glad to tell you that uh, many uh, many great institutions in india also are performing these type of robotic surgeries so that is a very a very good thing to know yeah yeah and like the you know now now that we are seeing so much progress in technology you must have also heard like man will be replaced by machines uh, and many other similar thoughts can this truly happen what do you all think like can doctors be truly replaced by technology i, I would like to know from you all <laughs> yeah you can you use, think? use the chat window So right now they are saying no, please no. I, I, <laughs> I think <Okay>. so. <laughs> no, yes. Ah, uh, great, great. The, these are great answers. Ah, uh, the thought that robots will uh, do the work of doctors might be true to some extent, but like j- only to some extent. Let Let's take an example. A machine can help us to choose the best treatment plan for a patient based on his history and many other factors. on the other hand a doctor can go 10 steps further they can ask if the patient can afford the treatment or not or simply whether the patient is happy with the treatment which is being offered to him or not and most importantly we cannot forget about the patient doctor relationship the sense of comfort that healthcare professionals provide to the patients 
which i think is very very valuable and that is something that technology however advanced it may become it can never replace yeah that was a beautiful end note yeah. absolutely absolutely if you think about it you share so much with a doctor that you will not tell anybody else right yeah, so much exactly. information and under so much confidentiality and mutual trust mutual trust mm-hmm. that is so yeah. important yeah and that brings to my that brings me to my last slide magic and medicine does anyone in the audience know who this person is who this very famous world very world famous person is uh oh fantastic what's your, what's your fan <laughs> oh so i think there are a lot of potter heads in our audience so yeah so this is obviously harry potter oh so someone is also saying daniel radcliffe that is great <laughs> so he is harry potter and besides him is a very famous painting called the doctor i'll just explain what these two things are so in the painting if you can see there is a doctor who is sitting sitting beside a clearly visible sick child and there are his parents in the background who you can see are very despondent very sad because uh the like the idea is like the doctor is pondering like what he can do next because uh okay i i'll explain it in this way in one of the harry potter movies there are two sides the good magicians and the bad or the evil magicians harry potter is one of the good magicians however the good side is losing the battle against the bad side at that time the non magic folk which you may know are called as muggles that is the people who can't do magic come to the good hearted magicians and say please save us you are magicians you can perform magic tricks nothing in the world should be impossible for you however this was not the case even though these mag- magicians uh were considered to be very powerful they had their limitations that is very similar to the field of medicine the current medicine that we have is far from perfect that is exactly why we need research research in the field of medicine helps us to remove these barriers and make sure that our patients get the best treatment which is possible yeah. thank you so much <laughs> that was thank that. you chinmay thank you Okay, so I think Snehal, what we can do is start taking a few questions. Yes. I have a few questions now. Um, I'm just going to go through the chat window and find a few questions. I think one of the questions which we received very early was about again some of the tools that uh, surgeons use. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that obviously there are common things like scissors, scalpels that we've all heard of, but are these tools different from the tools that we see around so is the scissors that a surgeon use supposed to be different than the scissor we see at home yeah very they are actually very different and they are uh, actually known as surgery grade scissors like mm-hmm. especially designed for surgeries so like they have certain characteristics which you don't see in your regular everyday scissors also the tools that i mentioned also include the robots that uh, we just saw in the, those pictures like the so the research that we are doing right now also helps to uh, you know develop more advanced robots which are more precise and more efficient at doing what they do all right okay another really interesting question that uh, was about the rib cage so we talked about all of these organs that are inside our thorax but is the rib cage also part of the thorax and are there surgeries on the rib cage or what happens if you have damage to your rib cage ah uh, yeah so actually I, like i said rib cage is uh, in the same part as of the thorax and it actually protects the organs which are inside your rib cage which are uh, like heart and lungs what happens usually like if uh if the rib cage is damaged like if those pro- bones break bones which are a part of the the rib cage which are known as the ribs if they break in some cases they might actually damage the organs inside of those rib cage if the wound is too severe so it like 
now now that we don't have the protection which was the rib cage the organs inside it are also vulnerable to damage yeah. wonderful and um, uh, chinmay snehal while you are looking for another question i'm seeing what sanjana wrote sanjana magesh so there are more causes including smoking for lung cancer if yes can you name some of the causes uh, chinmay this was your final surgery exam examiner asking you this question <laughs> it's absolutely this is like a question in a viva yeah that yeah. why will we screen non smokers obviously there are other causes of lung cancer and please name them so well done all of you have asked some really <laughs> intense questions and we are absolutely. contributing to chinmay's training as a surgeon <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thank you all of you <laughs> uh, so ala has a question yes nail you can can hila cells hila cells that one say you saw it Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Can it contribute to thoracic surgery research? Hila says, you know, uh, yeah, the cell line, the uh, the stem cells, right? Yeah, they're uh, not stem cells. Uh, they are just a cell line, like a cervical. Uh, am I right, Sneha? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, for those of you who don't know, these are very specific kinds of cells. Uh, originally, they were actually cells from somebody's tumor, right? Yes. Yeah, so, I, I think it was a cervical cancer. Yes, there was a woman named Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks. Her um, tumor, but they were the first cells from a human that were grown in a lab, and now they are used extensively in research in general. But are they also part of surgical research? Uh, I think they can be a part of uh, that research, but uh, as for myself, I haven't. Encountered uh, encountered any of those uh, any of that type of research yet, but. I think it should be possible. Yeah, certainly because it's a tumor cell line, so it yes. could be like a model system for cervical cancer yeah, or other yeah. similar cancers. Absolutely, yeah. study effect of treatments, etc. Very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Inma, for taking out the time and for coming with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Like it was such a wonderful session, and I, 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 I might actually say it was a very good, uh, like apart from the. usual schedule that we have it was a very good time to spend <laughs>